So what's unique about Eventbrite now, 15 years into the business, is we actually are starting to drive a lot of acquisition to our supply. And that means we have the potential to change our messaging, our pricing, et cetera, over time to incorporate that acquisition value prop to the supply side and message that network effect we are in the process of building, you know, more than we could in the past. Welcome to Two Sided, the Marketplace Podcast, brought to you by ShareTribe. Hello and welcome to the first episode of the second season of Two Sided. If you're new here, welcome. And if you listened to us before, welcome back. And my sincere apologies for taking so long with season two. Let me just say that we had some different priorities here at ShareTribe. But I'm very happy to be back in the podcasting game. Lots of people have reached out asking about the podcast and a new season. So during this, you know, let's call it a hiatus. So I'm very excited to be back. I think this is going to be another tremendous season. And I definitely could not have wished for a stronger first episode. Because today we're talking to the amazing Casey Winters, definitely one of the most knowledgeable and experienced two-sided platform people out there. He started at Apartments.com helped Grubhub to IPO ready, grew Pinterest to an enormous scale, and is now chief product officer at Eventbrite. And in the meantime, has also advised a gazillion marketplace startups in between. Hipcamp, Fair, Airbnb, Uber, GoFundMe. It's almost more difficult to name one that he hasn't advised. This is not the typical founder interview that you're used to. I mean, I was also mostly listening and learning, so it's maybe more like a lecture. And maybe lecture is the right word because Casey packed this chat full of knowledge. And you probably want to listen to it more than once. For me, the most interesting things we covered were the evolution of marketplaces over the last decade or so. What Casey sees as the different types of marketplace platform models and which market dynamics drive the choice for each of them. And then perhaps the coolest one is Eventbrite's transition from a SaaS to a SaaS-like network marketplace and how they're now seeing a shift in what they offer to both sides of the network. Finally, another cool last point, I think, was how to capture liquidity on low frequency marketplaces. So I'd say empty your brain for a moment, you know, whether you're walking or driving or whatever, and let your empty brain be filled with the marketplace wisdom of Casey Winters. Hi, Casey. Welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. Thanks a lot for coming on. I've been a fan for many years already. I, I don't usually use the word fan for like business related stuff, but I think this is this is fan level stuff. I obviously know who you are. And even though you're well known within the industry and probably many of the listeners do know us, I think there's also quite many who don't know you. So could you give us a little bit of context about yourself, about who you are and, and take us through your working history regarding marketplaces? Yeah, sure thing. So I'm currently the chief product officer at Eventbrite. I've been working at Eventbrite for about three years, and I manage the product management, product design, research, and growth marketing teams. But I started my career as an analyst at Apartments.com, and it was my job to measure everything we did to drive demand for effectiveness. And it was a really good way to not only learn about marketplaces, but it's a good way to learn about all these channels that you use to drive you know, traffic on the internet, which were you know, very different from what I learned about in school at the time. So I naturally started working on optimizing a lot of those channels once I understood how to measure them. These were things like you know, search engine optimization, AdWords, affiliate marketing, email. I, I then started trying to work more on the actual product experience to improve conversion and understand what could make you know, our experience stronger compared to competitors going to focus groups, et cetera. And it was at that time that Apartments.com told me I was this marketing and product hybrid. And they didn't really know what to do with that, as those were entirely separate departments. Things were pretty siloed back then. So I worked on a lot of entrepreneurial projects where that combo was a feature, not a bug. And one of those was a real estate competitor to Zillow and Trulia, where I joined pre-launch. I led all the online marketing, the analytics, and the biz dev. About a year and a half into that, it was 2008, turned out to not be such a great time to work on real estate. So I joined Grubhub after their 1 million Series A as their first marketing person. And did you already sort of like at apartments.com and when you joined Grubhub, did you already sort of realize, hey, this is like the same model? 
Like, was that already a thing? Oh, absolutely. Uh, so apartments.com was this uh, kind of crash course in these new internet business models and how you know they don't have inventory and, and they're extremely light on OPEX and, and, and super profitable. So the founders of Grubhub were actually both engineers that worked at the company I was at before. I didn't know them, but you know, we had mutual friends. So they were they were building something, you know, very similar. And it felt like even though it was an early stage company and you know, apartments.com was like 300 people, that oh, I recognize this model, I understand how it works, and I think I know how to grow it, versus if I had joined, you know, an enterprise SaaS company. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, that would have been a very different problem. I'd have had to learn a lot of things from scratch. Got it. Yeah. All right. So you joined Grubhub. Yeah. So I was uh, employee number 15, first marketing person. And unlike apartments.com, they didn't care what I worked on as long as I grew the demand side of the business. So Grubhub has, you know, restaurants on the supply side and then people who order food from them on the demand side. So I could change the product. I could run marketing campaigns, whatever needed to drive growth. So I worked on, you know, building out the SEO strategy, improving conversion rates, you know, new features for the core product, AdWords, email, loyalty, out of home television, you know, you name it. I tried it to get more people to order food online and we were, we were very successful. We grew it from, you know, a couple of cities when I joined to pretty much the entirety of the U.S. And I left shortly before Grubhub actually IPO'd. So it was a really great experience. And then I joined Pinterest. And by the time I joined Pinterest, they had a name for the type of work I did, which was called you know, growth. So I ended up leading the growth products team at Pinterest. And while I was there, we were able to make you know, SEO a primary growth channel. We were able to improve conversion rate by 5x and double the activation rate to really set us up for a sustainable growth strategy. And it was around that time that I started advising other companies on growth and scaling. So Airbnb and Pocket were my first two, two clients. So when I left Pinterest, I just became an exec in residence at Greylock, a venture firm you know, here in the Valley, and just started advising a lot of their companies on growth and, and scaling. And you know what I realized there is that for most of these startups, you know, it's their first time building a company, it's their first time working on a marketplace, and they're not sure what's normal, what's totally broken that they have to fix now, what's totally broken that they can wait five years to fix. Yeah. So it's at that time I started taking advising a lot more seriously and, and took on a bunch of my own clients. Eventbrite, Thumbtack, and Tinder were my first couple of clients. And then I added, you know, Reddit and Canva and, you know, Mercari, HipCamp, uh, mostly marketplace companies. And I just realized that, you know, being lucky enough to have gone through two startups that have gone on to scale and be worth billions and IPO, that I could help them, you know, no matter where their problem was, you know, if it's around hiring, if it's around fundraising, if it's around, you know, just growth, you know, obviously. So I not only started doing that, but I started working with this company called Reforge to build out, you know, teaching programs that could help scale kind of the teaching to their teams on, on things like product and, and growth, et cetera. So I was doing that for a couple of years and I was really happy doing it, but I really enjoyed the culture and the problems at Eventbrite. So when they opened up the chief product officer role, I, I took it. And yeah, now it's been three years. All right. Yeah, that is a fantastic journey. Like you're one of the few people who, uh, I don't know how many people there are actually who've been able to, like you said, like get marketplace or two-sided platform companies, two of them actually to this amazing, amazing size, because like often I'm trying to look for successors. And even though there's a lot of like interest in marketplaces, there are actually like in terms of huge ones, there aren't so many that like get up and then also stay up for a really long time. So. I think Rich Barton has like the peak of the industry there, founder of multiple of them. Okay. I should get him on next then. Yeah. That's a good idea. All right. Thanks. So that's huge experience in marketplaces. How have you seen them evolve over the past like 10 to 15 years in terms of business models, monetization models, and then and, and markets they are serving? Yeah. So, you know, when I started working in tech, marketplaces were this ultimate lightweight business model. You know, I had studied a lot of retail in college. So the idea of like going to apartments.com and not having any inventory and having so little OPEX was just like revolutionary to me. So a lot of these early marketplaces were super lightweight. You know, they connect buyers and sellers and, and get out of the way. Like many of them didn't even manage the payment flow. Like apartments.com, we didn't manage the payment flow. Neither did our biggest competitor at the time, you know, Craigslist. So you know, once these companies were created, these network effects, right, where they get stronger over time as they add, you know, more suppliers and, and more people buying had made them super sustainable and really hard to compete with. Like, it felt like they were entrenched. 
So I think the next generation of marketplaces felt like in order to be 10x better and supplant that network effect, these marketplaces had to build out a lot more product and service to win. So at first, this started by owning the transaction, then you know managing risk, which is what we did at Grubhub, right? And now you've seen that evolve further, where you know DoorDash managed to supplant Grubhub and market share by building out a fairly unprofitable delivery network to actually facilitate you know people getting their food, which meant they could offer it in many more markets like the suburbs in, in the United States. Yeah. And now that facilitation of the purchase is is common in in most dominant marketplaces where it definitely was not you know, when I started out. But that, of course, comes with increased cost. So many of these marketplaces have to build out additional business models outside of just that transactional fee to be able to support them, whether that's ads or SaaS fees. And that's certainly something we're doing at Eventbrite. Like we just launched, you know, our SaaS product last year, and that's going pretty well. What SaaS product is that actually? Because I tried to look for it, but I couldn't find it. Yeah, it's called Eventbrite Boost. So unlike a lot of other marketplaces, event creators are still doing a lot of their own marketing to drive people to Eventbrite to transact. Yeah. And what we realized is, you know, these are small businesses, they're wearing lots of hats, but they're not exactly expert marketers, and we kind of are. So we built a tool just to help them automate better marketing to drive, you know, people to their events. And that's something that's really resonated with the market. And that's something we continue to invest in. So is it things like, can they buy like paid marketing, for example? Yeah. So, you know, Everything from like, you know, Facebook, at Facebook, Instagram advertising to also email marketing, which are the two main channels that event creators use today. Got it. Got it. Cool. Maybe I'll cut this out. But like, I remember that we discussed this in the Reforge class. That's like, oh, one of the things like, what could Eventbrite do to service them better? And I was like, I don't know. Do they have that? I, I think that was part of the discussion. And then you vaguely alluded that this might be something we do in the future. And probably it was being developed at the same time. So that is cool. Yeah, we built it. And <laughs> yeah, it's, it seems to be working so far. Excellent. Yeah. And so how about markets? So like this was like the, you know, the type of business model, like you said, like moving up more from just facilitating transactions to actually handling the transaction, yeah. owning the experience. So how have you seen like the markets that, you know, marketplaces are, are seen sometimes as this huge disruptive force? So how have you seen that develop? Yeah, I think on the market side, probably the most exciting transition we've seen more recently is the ability to make the marketplace model work in B2B transactions. Fair is a company I advise that's a notable example on the wholesale side of things. But in order to make those work, they're usually much more complex where workflow is as important as a feature as demand. But we're really starting to see a lot more of these marketplace models be attached to, you know, these more complex B2B transactions than just consumer, which I think, you know, for the first, you know, decade to, to two of, of marketplaces was all we saw. Yeah, yeah, got it. In terms of like the future of business models, like, because you have a great piece on your blog, which you can find at caseyaccidental.com, by the way, for the listeners at home, about the sort of the three stages or three types of online marketplaces, which basically ends with owning the supply completely. And also more recently, you wrote this great article together with, I hope I say it right, like Gilad Horev, yep. about, you know, this vertical integration as a sort of final stage of marketplaces. Like, could you tell us a little bit about through your thinking there for those of us who haven't actually read the article? Yeah, sure. So, you know, as, as we talked about a little bit earlier, there's a difference between a product just that just connects buyers and sellers, like say the Facebook marketplace, and is otherwise, you know, buyer beware, and a product that processes transactions and manages risk and fraud and trust, like say an Airbnb, versus a marketplace that does a lot of work in facilitating the value, like a DoorDash handling the delivery themselves, or, you know, FAIR creating more favorable payment terms and offering free returns. And then you see some companies like an open door that appear to operate like a marketplace to, to buyers and sellers, but they actually are managing inventory. So like the core element of a, a marketplace, which is like, oh, you know, the supply has the inventory, isn't really true. In those cases, they're buying the homes directly and then finding people who they can sell them to. So that obviously has a very different, you know, operating expense uh, look than a lot of these other marketplace models. Yeah. I don't think it's that one of them, one of those models is better than another and that like vertically integrated is is like the final form that every market needs to go to. I think there are dynamics of the market that kind of dictate, you know, what the equilibrium of the market should be and what's most sustainable. So like you could take food delivery as an example, because it's something I've spent a lot of time on. There have basically been you know, food delivery companies that have been started and scaled in each one of those models, right? The, you know, the yeah. first model, right, which is more of just like the listings was like a Yelp, right? Like, hey, you can browse, you can find things, 
And then if you want to actually like go to that restaurant or order food from that restaurant, like, hey. Yeah, here's the address. <laughs> yeah, and that's how Grubhub you know, started as well before it added online ordering. And then Grubhub was the first to scale really with that online ordering functionality, which means we process the transaction. You know, if something goes wrong with the order, like we take care of it, all of that kind of stuff. And then, you know, what Postmates and, you know, DoorDash started to do was actually, we actually make the deliveries happen. Like a lot of people don't know this, but like when you order from Grubhub, most of the time, like the restaurant on its own processes that order and has a delivery driver that they work with that manages it. Whereas, you know, DoorDash and Postmates were like, no, we have the delivery driver and, you know, we'll make sure the food gets there. And that meant they didn't necessarily need to work with the restaurant directly. So that allowed them to scale to more and more markets, but obviously a lot more expensive to manage a fleet of, you know, delivery drivers. And then there were companies, this has kind of died off in the delivery space, but there were companies like Bio Sprig, for example, and they had all of the elements of a marketplace to the consumer. But the reality is like they were just making the food in like a dark kitchen somewhere. And they also managed the delivery drivers. So they didn't really have as much variety on the supply side, but otherwise were a competitor in that market. And I think what we've seen is like the Sprigs of the world, they haven't really been able you know, to sustain because the market has like this triangle, right? Between price, time, and quality, right? So yeah. Sprig was trying to have a, a good price, was trying to get it to you in 10 minutes and have it be quality food. And the reality is like, you can do all three of those <laughs> or at a profitable level, right? So they were losing yeah. dollars per order, which meant they had to either trade off on quality or trade off on price or trade off on time. And ultimately those trade-offs meant that they couldn't really find product market fit with consumers. So what we've seen is the dominant model is not a vertically integrated model like a Sprig. The dominant model seems to be a, a you know heavily managed marketplace that's facilitating the the delivery of the value like like a DoorDash or an Uber Eats. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks. That was an excellent analysis. I never looked at it like that, but that triangle is kind of indeed like sacred unbreakable space. You can probably not own, you know, it's like other things with like you can have something fast, cheap or good quality like that's just that never gets broken. And so, well, you started with some marketplaces of considerable size and you said that you advised Uber and Airbnb. Like, do you see any you know, now that we have seen this sort of like uh, marketplace takeover of the world, do you think any, are there any opportunities for these major global marketplaces still in the size of Uber and Airbnb? Well, I think specifically in those cases with Airbnb and, and Uber, they pointed out opportunities where supply was artificially constrained due to regulation. And they leveraged consumer sentiment to effectively change regulations. And that allowed them to unlock these these fairly large markets. So I think to try to find these major global marketplace opportunities, you are looking for something in the market, could be regulation, could be could be elsewhere, that's artificially constraining the supply and therefore could be you know raising the price. And you know, where else could you do this? Well, I think the first place I look is anywhere where there is regulation that caps supply. This could be like licenses in areas like, you know, doctors. Yeah. You know, countries that have like very high minimum wage laws that might be you know, taking people out of the market that would be willing to work for cheaper. But, yeah. you know, I have no idea of any of those specific ideas that would work. Otherwise, you know, I would have probably started them already. Yeah, probably. All right. Yeah, thanks. That's, that's I never thought about those. But indeed, like regulation as a sort of constraint indicator is precisely what Uber has been always like lobbying against. So that makes total sense. And from a more, you know, if we look at a smaller, like non-venture back marketplace from a more lean standpoint, do you see any opportunities there for marketplaces still? I think there's a lot of opportunity there because while we think of these marketplaces as like massively global scale, not raising venture gives you a lot of opportunities you otherwise might not consider because you don't have to prove how large the addressable market is to anyone to, to get money. And non-venture size outcomes can still create a ton of value in these markets and life-changing money for, you know, for the employees. So you know, one of my favorite marketplaces is Discogs, which I don't think has ever raised money but it's not only like the true catalog of like music releases on the internet, but also monetizes through largely like selling vinyl but between buyers and sellers. So I think about like, what are those things that might appear too small to be considered a venture backed market? So like, for example, in college, I built a product around the Tony Hawk's pro skater video game. That's probably too small to be a venture market, but like you could probably build a profitable business there now. I built a product once around obscure electronic music. Like you can make things like that into successful businesses now with the scale of the internet, even if they seem like extremely niche, you know, for say like more of a venture backed company. 
Yeah, that's the other. We see lots of those, like super niche models. Like I think I had a talk with, I think it was Boris Wirtz who said that like there, you know, there's a huge, huge class of those type of ideas that don't cap the the requirements for venture capital, but are still like indeed like life changing businesses, like in terms of size. Absolutely. Yeah, Discogs. I always forget about Discogs that it technically, you know, like that has been around for so long that it's just like no, it's just Discogs. It's its own. It's its own thing, but yeah, it's like totally a marketplace. Like, yeah, let's talk a little bit about Eventbrite. So, so we're talking about you know marketplaces that may or may not be considered marketplaces. Eventbrite is a marketplace by some definition, but kind of a special one. How do you currently define Eventbrite? So, a lot of people would see Eventbrite from the outside and consider it a traditional marketplace with a you know cross side network effect, just like any other. And that's not really how we see it internally. We think Eventbrite is something we call a SaaS like network. We have buyers and sellers, but we sell a monetization value prop and an efficiency value prop to our supply who are event creators, not an acquisition value prop to supply. You know, we get you more tickets sold. It's usually an acquisition value prop that you see drives those cross-site network effects we traditionally associate with marketplaces. And on the demand side, we mostly historically have sold an ease of use value prop, like you can buy the ticket easily and we're not going to charge you an insane amount of fees. And usually it's a discovery value prop on the demand side that drives those, those cross-site network effects. So we've seen a number of these companies emerge in the last decade that connect buyers and sellers like Eventbrite, but the seller is primarily there for monetization and the seller feels like it's responsible to bring the buyers directly to the marketplace instead of the marketplace doing that themselves. So you can think about you know Square, or Patreon, Substack, GoFundMe, Kickstarter. They're all examples of this. And their growth dynamics are very different from these other marketplace models, you know, even if they look similar from the outside. So what's unique about Eventbrite now, 15 years into the business, is we actually are starting to drive a lot of acquisition to our supply. And that means we have the potential to change our messaging, our pricing, et cetera, over time to incorporate that acquisition value prop to the supply side and message that network effect we are in the process of building you know, more than we could in the past. So we're in this state of transition from a SaaS like network to something that, you know, we still are really good at that, but we also are now driving an incredible amount of uh, acquisition. And how does that change the business model over time? So it's, it's a really exciting time. Yeah, that's really cool because like, you know, last season when I talked to Lenny Rzitzky, you know, but I'm saying his full name, but I know that you know him as Lenny, but yeah. Like he has this model where it's like, you know, he has this great blog post, how to kickstart and scale a marketplace where he goes through the steps and then which side are you constrained on? And like, he, I think he mentions there that like sometimes it's changes and, you know, it could potentially change on event, right? That at some point you might be supply constrained if like you become such the dominating way to buy, t- like, you know, like that people look to you to what to do on the weekend that actually you might need more supply, like you might need more event organizers. Exactly. Well, that's cool. That's a really cool, you know, evolution. Talking about evolution, like, so like you said, like Eventbrite didn't really start as a marketplace, but rather as a sort of SaaS tool. Yeah. Could you tell us a little bit about the transition? Because like, well, maybe transition, it's not like, I think you rightfully point out earlier already, or like in your article said, like, it's more like layering something on top. So it's not like, well, we leave one behind, but could you tell us about, well, let's still call it a transition. Yeah, sure. So as we think about this transition, like, how is that occurring? Well, well, the the original idea for Eventbrite was Kevin Hart's one of the founders was early at PayPal and he wanted to explore, you know, other industries where they could make payments easier on the web and they found event ticketing. So as an event creator, the idea was you sign up, you set up your bank account, you create a listing page, and then you send your audience to Eventbrite to transact. And then we de- deposit the money in your bank account minus our fee. You know how many people are coming, you know how much to plan, you know, all that kind of stuff. And two amazing things happened from that initial core product experience. One was many of the people who bought tickets ended up creating events on Eventbrite themselves later on. So this meant Eventbrite grew virally through our user-generated content, which was events, which I don't think was exactly planned. And the second was that all of our event creators were doing marketing that meant they were sending people directly to Eventbrite which means they were sending like links directly to Eventbrite. And if you know anything about the Google algorithm, you know that quantity and quality of external links is one of the key ranking signals. So we started getting all of these links from our our creators. So then we just started creating pages showing the inventory of our creators, all these cool events to consumers. So this is like, you know, a San Francisco events page. 
And these pages started ranking really highly when consumers searched for Google for you know events or things to do. And this started driving incremental demand to event creators beyond their own marketing efforts. And then, you know, as more and more people started buying tickets, we then had their emails. We could tell them about other events they might be interested in. We then started building like search and browse functionality. So if you're like, Eventbrite, like I want to do a cool music show this weekend, we could show you a bunch of options. We then layered in, you know, partnerships with Facebook and Spotify to get more exposure for our event inventory. And all of these just kept increasing the percentage of ticket sales that Eventbrite drove directly versus were coming from the event creator's own marketing efforts. And I'd say we're still in the beginning phases of understanding how this new core competency we've built in driving demand works and how we like fully leverage it as a company, but it's very exciting for us. Yeah, that does sound very exciting. And it's a great segue into my next question because you know we can't really talk about marketplaces and not mention liquidity or chicken and egg problem, demand supply problem. So first of all, like, how do you usually determine with the marketplace or how would you usually determine what side to focus on? Yeah. So I usually try to determine which side with some latency can attract the other side easiest. Nine times out of 10, that means you start with attracting supply first. It's hard to have a good discovery product, which as I said, is usually the primary value prop for demand if there's no supply to show them. So the exception to that rule is when you can show a good discovery experience without that direct relationship with supply, like we talked about you know, with, with DoorDash and, and Postmates in the previous example. This is actually how Grubhub started too. What Grubhub did is it aggregated every delivery menu in the city, scanned them, and put them online. Thumbtack is a, a, another similar example. But even at Grubhub, we started demand first and used that to build an audience to then you know, attract restaurants directly. We eventually figured out that while starting with demand works, starting with supply was actually more efficient and would work faster. So for all of our new markets, we switched to starting with supply first. All right. So when, when you do supply, like what are some of the best tactics, strategies to succeed supply? Yeah. So this is an area where venture capital can be very helpful. Like, you know, Uber and Lyft, for example, you know, just paid their drivers, whether they got rides or not in the early days to make sure they had supply for riders. At Grubhub, we didn't quite have that venture capital footprint that they did, right? We raised a 1 million Series A, which is now a, a small seed round. But what we did find is if we went to restaurants directly, um, and sign them up, they would give us about four months before they really expected to see a volume of incremental orders. So this kind of started the clock on my job, you know, as the demand side to really show them incremental orders. So what we started doing is we clustered where we would sign up supply so that we could have enough content in a local area to have great SEO and SEM landing pages within a variety to drive decent conversion rate. And that was our main way to drive demand. So, you know, primarily AdWords and SEO. And we found that to be very scalable. So, you know, start with supply, you know, get 50 restaurants in a, in a very dense area, then go start, you know, building, you know, SEO and SEM expertise to make sure those places got orders before the restaurants wanted to cancel. Yeah. And then when you look at demand, right, like you said, it's probably in rare cases, the first one to look at, but if you wouldn't need to look at it, how would you go about that? Yeah, I think you see in most cases, you're either building a listing style product like Grubhub did in its first market, or you're scraping or faking that you have supply. And then when you get demand, you basically send it as a lead to try to get that supply to sign up when there's actually a booking. So, you know, Grubhub built a list of all these delivery restaurants that before it worked with restaurants directly, and it just went to restaurants and said, we have people looking for to order food, you should sign up for online ordering. You know, Thumbtack had this lead gen flow for demand where it would then just, you know, take any lead it got and then email local suppliers it knew in the area, and that would get them to sign up for Thumbtack initially. So I'd say a key thing to remember about these seeding strategies, whether it's supply or it's demand, is this is work that is not sustainable. And that's okay. Like you're doing a bunch of unsustainable work, but the goal is to do the unsustainable work to unlock liquidity, which is the network effect. And then the network effect is the more sustainable growth strategy for your business. And it, you're going to have to defeat that network effect as well, but that's really what product market fit is. So you're willing to do all this non-scalable stuff to get to that liquidity or product market fit. And then at that point, you switch to some of the things we talked about as more of the sustainable growth tactics. Yeah, that's great because actually I wanted to talk about, well, I wanted to hook on to what you said earlier about like start it small, right? Like you mentioned something like get 50, 50 restaurants in the right. um, in the region. And that's something that we've heard like a lot actually on the podcast. I think also I haven't had the honor yet to email her, but I think Sarah Tavel has this 
white hot center metaphor yeah. and like um, you already told a little bit about Grubhub, but could you tell a little bit more about how you, you know, because Grubhub started in Chicago, I believe. Yeah, really in one neighborhood in Chicago. All right. Yeah. So could you tell us a little bit how that goes? And also like, how do you make that decision then to like, okay, now, you know, now we move to the next one. Yeah. So I think the main goal, and there's not a lot online about this, but we were trying to understand is the shape of the network effect that you're trying to build. So uh, Ritual is one of these companies I advise, and their network effect is how long you're willing to walk for a coffee or lunch. That is a very small distance, whereas compare that to like Etsy, right? Etsy's yeah. network effect is wherever it can ship. So like that's pretty global, you know, Rituals is hyper local. And then a lot of the companies we've talked about, you know, are, are more in between like Uber, you know, mainly it's about cars in the area that you are, but you could also mm. use it when you travel. So there are some more global elements, you know, Airbnb, I mainly care about, does it have places where I'm traveling today? But if it's adding supply in places I may travel in the future, I'll, I'll at some point, you know, get, get a benefit from that. But your only goal is to get an initial network effect to work. And that's what we call liquidity or product market fit. So you don't want to expand into incremental markets until you have liquidity in you know, the network effect that you decided is the appropriate shape. It could be one market, it could be one category, whatever. And yeah. then if you manage to unlock that, which is usually the hardest part, you're trying to understand what created that so that you can replicate it in these other markets. And in order for it to be you know, possible for a market or a category to get to liquidity, you know, my belief is the frequency of transaction needs to be somewhat high. So a lot of the examples we've used are in food or transportation, things that you're going to need to do at least once daily, right? Yeah. You can make up for that if the value of that transaction is incredible compared to the status quo. Like, you know, Airbnb was both cheaper and in a cooler part of town than hotels, right? And that allowed them to build a successful marketplace despite being low frequency. Zillow managed to take a low frequency, you know, habit of, of buying a home and turned it into like, keeping track of the value of your home. So, so there are ways to get around the, the frequency issue. But the companies that can focus their marketplace on one category typically have that high frequency, like food you know, for Grubhub yeah. or, or transport for Uber. And those that don't frequently need to be category agnostic to find that initial liquidity. Like Thumbtack is in a ton of categories. Poshmark is in a ton of categories. Upwork's in a ton of categories in order to be able to get you know, those network effects to really work. Great. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So shape, what, what do you mean with shape in this way? Like, is that, do you mean like... How global versus local the network effect is and what is enough inventory to create a high frequency experience so that you can get you know, buyers and sellers coming back on a, on a regular basis. You know, otherwise they're not going to remember you the next time they have that that need, yeah. right? So, you know, in the case of Thumbtack, well, if you hopefully only get a wedding DJ once in your lifetime, you're not going to be building like a high frequency relationship with Thumbtack, but if they also do, you know, everything around your house or, yeah. you know, lots of random chores, you can build up a frequency of using Thumbtack for lots of different things. Yeah, that's actually, talking about frequency, just on a, to go on a slight sidetrack, how do you think about like low frequency marketplaces then? You know, like, well, you mentioned Zillow earlier, I believe that like, you know, like you're not going to buy a house every, like, how do you go about determining liquidity then? Yeah, so the main issue you have with low frequency marketplaces is that it's hard for you to own demand which is typically the dominant strategy of marketplace. If you own the demand, supply will always come to you to get access, you know, to those bookings or orders or whatever. So it's really hard to it's really hard to own demand as a low frequency marketplace. You can build liquidity, but a lot of times you have to frequently keep buying the demand, which is obviously a lot less profitable. Yeah. So the strategies that low frequency marketplaces use to get around that constraint are either they have dominant distribution with where their demand is. So even if they don't own it, they're very well represented with whatever owns demand. So commonly that's Google, right? So take apartments.com, we're super, super low frequency marketplace, but dominant SEO. So if we know you're going to go to Google when you have the need and we're always going to rank number one, it's almost as good as us owning the demand you know, directly. Not quite, but, but close, right? But it doesn't have to be Google, right? Like your demand might be on Reddit and you have a great presence there. Your demand might be, you know, in Discord, right? As long as you have access to that demand, that can make up for the fact that you don't really like own it and they think of you directly. So I'd say that's the most common strategy low frequency marketplaces use. And then we talked about the Airbnb example earlier where even though they're low frequency, they were just like 10x better 
yeah. than everything else you could do. And that created a really strong brand perception, which created loyalty even with low frequency. And Airbnb has been able to maintain that you know, over time, even as it isn't so much cheaper than a hotel anymore, you know, things like that have started to degrade. Now the brand's been able to, uh, to keep those people loyal and engaged. So that's, that's a common one you see. I think some others that are, are less frequent, but definitely work when you can make them work is the Zillow example is they took a low frequency transaction and they sequenced a higher frequency engagement product on top of it. In their case, this estimates. And you've seen other marketplaces do this, where if the transaction is infrequent, the way that they can guarantee they'll get the transaction, which needs to be you know higher in value to make up for the lack of frequency, is that they have some sort of way to keep you in network so that when you need to transact, you're definitely going to do it with them. And I think you know Zillow is, of course, the, the best example of that. And then the last is crafting your product as a bit of an insurance play so that even if the need for it is rare, the need for it is super intense when it occurs. So you want to make sure you, you, know, you have the product for when it needs. So this is how most insurance products work. Hotel Tonight's a good example of this outside of insurance where, yeah. you know, I would keep it on my phone in case I got stuck somewhere in business travel, right? And I hope to not get stuck. I hope to never use it, but like it's going to stay on my phone. It's going to stay top of mind for when that uh, use case occurs. And that use case has occurred. And I've used Hotel Tonight in, in those instances. So those are some four that I feel like are really good strategies to kind of keep a close relationship with demand, whereas usually because of low frequency, you can't own demand. Yeah, thanks. That's a great answer for like low frequency marketplace. Like we see that more and more, especially like B2B, where there's a lot more of those kind of things coming. But those four points are great. Market point, if I remember correctly, you have a also a blog post on that at kzaccidental.com. I could pick your brain for another hour about marketplaces and we could go down many, many rabbit holes. But I want to thank you for your time and thanks for coming on. As a last thing, is there anything, uh, you know, how can people follow you, read what you're writing, anything you would like to plug? Yeah, sure. So I write a lot frequently about marketplaces at caseyaccidental.com or, or tweet about them at one case man and uh, build programs on product and growth at Reforge. And of course, if you're looking for something fun to do this weekend, there's always Eventbrite. All right. Thanks a lot, Casey. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Two Sided, the Marketplace podcast. If you enjoyed today's show, don't forget to subscribe. If you listen on iTunes, we'd also love for you to rate and give us a review. If you got inspired to build your own marketplace, go visit www.sharetribe.com. It's the fastest way to build a successful online marketplace business. Until next time.